This journey, 2010, is about having a church comprised of uh, people who have individually decided to follow God's will in their daily lives. Now, let me just add that as a pastor, I find it very interesting when I meet with people privately at their homes. I find, and I'm not pointing at anyone, but I'm just finding that most people, when you visit them in their homes, are on guard. Do you know what I mean by on guard? Um, especially if you're older and you've been in churches where the pastor has used you as a sermon illustration, for example. You, know, you, you, you naturally tend to watch what you say, what you have out, things like that, because we're afraid the pastor is you know, going to be judgmental or this or that. Hopefully I'm not that way to you. Hopefully I'm, I, I don't, uh, you don't have to question what I'm doing. Uh, I genuinely enjoy talking with you all and visiting with you. And uh, you're welcome to visit with me anytime at all, too. But I will confess that, for the most part, I really enjoy pe visiting people when they're lying on a gurney in a hospital. Now, that may seem strange. But I have found that when people are facing surgery and I'm visiting with them, that there's no pretense. There's, there's no false, uh, they're not trying to pretend to be anything. I can tell when they're nervous. I can tell when they're anxious. You know, if they've got false teeth, they're out too. You know, and I, and I don't mind any of that. It, it doesn't matter at all to me. But I really like transparent honesty. And I'm mentioning this because for the most part, everyone in this church questions whether there is God's will or not. If there's anything we struggle with, it's struggling with this idea that there is an overriding will of God for my life. You won't ever mention it to me. You won't ever say, oh, I really wonder about this, Pastor. It's just one of those things that we accept. Well, there is God's will. But inwardly, we question it. And if you're 35 or under, the idea of God's will is totally foreign to you. It's something that just you don't buy. You live by that credo that life happens. And the only time you need God in your life is when something really bad happens and you kind of wonder what's going on. Now, I know this is true. You may say, no, I never question God's will. If you think you know what God's will is, you've got it all figured out. Your mind is deceiving you. Amen. You don't know. You, have a, you haven't a clue about God's will. Amen. It's awesome. It's something that it's, we can't even comprehend. But I do know something that I will die defending. And that, that is that this word here is life. And not only is it life, but it is for my life. This is not just a collection of good things that will, if you believe in them, if you say some magic prayer, will get you to heaven. No, this word is for your life today, tomorrow. It's for you at work. It's for everything you do in your life. And when you're not in this word, you are robbing yourself of any chance of knowing God. Amen. This word, this word is the key to eternal life. It is the method of eternal life. It is the way of eternal life. But it is also for your life. It will give you cleansing. It will heal you. It will do all kinds of amazing things because God said it would. And if you do not know Jesus Christ, you are robbing yourself not only of eternal life, but of life itself because Jesus is the Word. You cannot divorce Jesus from the Word. 
If you think you can pray to God and if you think you can get to God, if you think you can get to heaven without Jesus Christ, you are a fool, you are blind, and you will wake up burning in hell. Because Jesus Christ is this word. And if you don't come to Jesus Christ and ask Him to be your Savior, Ask Him to open this Word to you. Open that life to you. You are robbing yourself of any chance of ever having an idea of what God's will is. You are robbing yourself of any chance of ever seeing God. And you are assuring yourself that when you die, you will get exactly what you were planning for. And that is a life separated from God, separated from His Son, and totally in agony in hell. Amen. I'll give you that about God's will. It starts with Jesus. Now, what is the will of God for me, Pastor? I've got some things going on in my life. I can't figure out what to do. You know, I, I, should I go to college? That's a big one. Which one? What should I major in? Should I get married? Which one? Now, if you're already married, that doesn't apply, okay? Uh, I can't stand my job. Should I look for another? Or should I just quit and hope something pops up? Should I keep doing it and you'll lead me somewhere else? A friend of mine wants me to share a place with me. Should I? Should I live at home? I'm getting ready to retire. Can I afford to? Where should we live? We have two children. We're thinking about having a third or fourth, fifth, sixth, I don't care. Should we have another one? Or should we think about adopting? Or in my wife's case, and I, how do we keep from having kids? <laughs> I feel like God is wanting me to go into ministry. What does he want me to do? Is it missions, youth, pastor, uh, youth or pastor? What, what do we, I do? Let me give you something. I had six kids. Still have six kids, praise God. They're not living at home, which is probably the biggest blessing in the world. No credit card bills, uh, no paying for their insurance, you know, all that stuff. I love it. I had one rule. I said, before you get married... You have to go to college. You have to get a degree. It's a crazy rule. And the other thing is about that rule, I said you can't go to state college. It's got to be a college that you seek out, you go to, that, you want to that, that fits what you want to do in your life. And the reasons were that I didn't want a state college because I wanted them to apply to a college where they might not have the chance of being accepted. I want them to have to figure out that this is something I've got to apply for and work for. State colleges, most anyone can get into. Did you know that? Okay. They, they've raised their standards a little bit, but most anyone can get into. And also, I wanted them to live in the dorms. I wanted them out of the house. I want them to live in the dorms, experience what dorm life is all about. And it's all about friends, about making right decisions, about managing your money, what little money you have, you have to manage it. They have to make all these decisions. So our kids all moved away. One went to Pepperdine in Malibu. One went to the University of Denver. Another one went to Emory in Atlanta. Uh, my gals kind of stayed close to home, but they still lived in dorms. Uh, one went to Mid-America Nazarene. Another one to Rockhurst. Uh, the youngest went to Texas Christian University, TCU. You know, it would have been a lot easier if they'd just gone to KU. No decisions, you know, just cheaper and all that stuff. Oh, and I did give my kids the gift of debt. I believe hardly in borrowing to pay for college. It's probably the best investment you'll ever make if you finish. It also teaches you responsibility. Well, I've got to get a job after college to pay for that loan. So I believe in it. That's one time, a loan for your house, loan for college. It's an investment in the future. Here's... Here's why I did this with my kids. I, I believe that this was probably the greatest lesson for them 
in starting to know about God's direction in their life. And there's four reasons for it. I, I believe that kids need to learn that honoring what your parents want is probably the most important thing you have to learn. If there's any way you can figure out God's will, if you're not honoring your parents, you don't have a clue about God's will. Because God says, honor them. And if you're rebellious to your parents, guess what? You're rebellious to God. So don't ask God for what his will is if you don't know what your parents want or if you refuse to do what they want. Second thing, you've got to get yourself in a place where you make decisions that require God. God doesn't want you to go through life just with no brains or just on coasting. It's it doesn't mean that you can't go get a job and stuff at high school, but you the thing is this required them to make a decision that they had to lean upon God. We had to research colleges. We had to pray together. We had to seek it. That's what God wants you to do. The third thing is I wanted them to learn that the most important lesson you ever have in life is you finish what you start. And every one of my kids finished their college degree. A couple of them started out at one college and went to another. It didn't matter. They still finished what they started. Four of them went on for advanced degrees. And the biggest thing I wanted to learn through this is that there are, there are no entitlements, no guarantees in life. This life is probably the roughest thing that you can ever have face you square in the face. There's no guarantee you're going to have a job. There's no guarantee dad's going to take care of you the rest of your life. There's no guarantee this is going to be done for you. Whatever happens in your life, it's going to be up to you and the decisions you make and how you develop character in your life. And that's why I believe that college was so important. Now, I firmly believe that a lot of people that moan and groan about not knowing God's will are covering up the fact that they're selfish and that they're lazy. Oftentimes, God has been telling them what he wants them to do, but they simply don't want to do it. And so they moan and groan. I can't figure out what he wants me to do. When God has been doing everything but blasted into the sky with a searchlight. If your parents say to do something, even though you've moved away, there's called something called the chain of counsel. And they have the loudest voice you should listen to. Parents, you better be in touch with God. Because you have a lot of responsibility for your kids. God doesn't keep us wondering all the time. God is, knowing his will is probably one of the, the best things he wants to do for you. But the problem is he often won't let you know what his will is until you're ready to do what? To do it. If you're not ready to do it, guess what? Why should I talk to you? Now, did my kids make mistakes in the colleges they went to, or how they did everything. You know what? They did. Did I make mistakes when I went to college? Did you know I got kicked out of my Bible college? <laughs> Some people would say that was a big mistake. Did I question whether I went to the right college? Did I question God's will? No. I even looked into going to another college and saying, well, you know, whatever to you guys. But you know what? God said, you finish what you start. And you know what? He said, Jim, there's some rough edges in your life you've got to start working on. And you can do it by going back. We in America are such quitters. We've become a nation of quitters. When things get tough, when 
something happens at church or when this or that happens at work or this happens at school, this friend does that, we quit instead of letting that develop what God's will is all about. And I'll mention in just a minute. We don't finish. We don't keep pressing on. If this nation had been founded last year, back in New England, we never would have made it across to the West. Never. We'd stayed back. Here's what God wants about his will. Psalms 11:7 says the Lord is righteous. He loves righteous deeds. The upright shall behold his face. You know, the mistakes my kids did and the jobs they chose and the careers and the husbands they chose and the wives they chose, I didn't really care. But what I did care was whatever decision they did make was that it developed character in their life. I want my kids to be upright because I know that no matter if they're a ditch digger, an asphalt worker, whatever it is, if they are upright doing it, they shall stand before God. Even my son, Jimmy, that just got fired from my brother's company, the same brother that kicked me out 20 years ago. God had already prepared me because I know that what happened in my life worked to develop character in my life. So that's the first thing I started talking to my son. How is this going to develop character in your life? And he was able to share some things about what God was teaching him. You see, where you go to work, where you go to school, who you marry, who this or that, it's not as important as what kind of man or woman you're going to become during that. God brings this truth through some other verses. In Psalm 36.10, it says, Oh, continue your steadfast love to those who know you. And your righteousness to the upright of heart. Psalm 140, 13. The upright shall dwell in your presence. Proverbs 2, 21. For the upright will inhabit the land, and those with integrity will remain in it. Proverbs 3, 32. The devious person is an abomination to the Lord, but the upright are in his confidence. If you're not desiring to be upright, you won't be in the confidence of God. You won't have access to what He's wanting to do with your life. Proverbs 11.3, The integrity of the upright guides them, but the crookedness of the treacherous destroys them. Ecclesiastes 7.29, I have discovered that God created people to be upright or virtuous, but they have each turned to follow their own downward path. Most of us stop following the will of God or get lost in knowing the will of God because we devised our own path and we've gone down that path. And unfortunately, that path leads downward. From these verses, I discovered the first truth of knowing God's specific will for your life. And that is that God's will is for you to be upright. The biggest question you ask yourself is not where I go to college, not whom I marry. You ask, how will this gal work to make me more upright? How will this college work to make me more upright? How will this job work to make me more upright. That is what God wants. He wants people whose desire is to be upright. This life and everything that happens. You know, because sometimes we make a decision and we do this and then all kinds of things happen. Get kicked out of college. 
get this or that, you know, all kinds of things happen. And I've learned that no matter what happens in your life, it's going to be either a stumbling block or it's going to be a stepping stone. There is no middle ground. There is no room for apathy when we face a tragedy or when we face an upset or a, uh, something that throws us back. There's no room for apathy. We will always react in one of two ways. We'll either get mad at God and draw back or we'll say, God, what do you want me to learn? Show me your will. It's either going to be a stumbling block or a stepping stone. You've got to realize that in your life. But realize this, that you are never as upright before God as when you are before Him in humility and prayer. Being upright does not refer to your stature, what job you have, where you bank, what car you've got. It refers to the condition of your heart. And everything in this life will work to either eat at your heart or to enlarge your heart. And that's how you know the will of God. What about these failures? Because, man, I've done some things that I just know that I kept butting my head against the wall. What, and, and surely that couldn't have been God's will. You know, I, I, we've got a good friend that, you know her, she's been here at church. Uh, lived down in Texas. Her son married what I would consider the ideal candidate for a, for a woman, for a wife. Dad was wealthy. She was very attractive. Uh, excellent college, excellent pedigree, if you want to say. You know, just if everyone would think she was a, like a, what they call a trophy wife for an older man, but only he's younger. But it's turned out that she is probably the most selfish person you could ever imagine living with. And they're already having to go to counseling after six months. Now, we could say, oh, he made a mistake. That wasn't God's will. I'm sorry. Whether or not it was God's will, it's God's will. They're married. It's a covenant. And I'm praying that God will work in that marriage. I hate to see that end. You know, the Hebrews had a real problem going across the wilderness. They made all kinds of mistakes. And time after time, God gave them a chance to get it right, to get their heart right. And finally, this one time when they'd been complaining and the serpents were nipping at them and killing thousands, Moses intervened and God says, lift up that serpent. And if anyone gazed upon that serpent... They'll be healed. We get ourselves in all kinds of situations. We, we make mistakes as we traverse this life. And I'm convinced that God works through those mistakes. In fact, sometimes God is applauding in heaven when we make that mistake. You know why? Because it causes us to look to Him. It causes us to come to Him and say, God, teach me through this. Show me your heart. Show me what's wrong. And that's what He wants. He wants us to look at Him. Amen. And these people could look and be healed. But the problem was, if we keep on being stubborn and keep on making the same mistakes over and over, God says, enough is enough. And that's why they died in the wilderness. Because they did not learn to be a, that that thing could be a stepping stone to God. Now there's four more verses I want to consider. Proverbs 16, 9. In his heart man plans his course but the Lord determines his steps. You know, one thing about Solomon, he was the wisest man that ever lived because he asked God for wisdom. And if you read Solomon, if you read Proverbs, you cannot but help but be impressed with the sovereignty of God and how God works in our lives. And this came from the man who was the wisest on earth. 
And like I said last week, wisdom is seeing things from God's point of view. So one thing Solomon had was he had God's point of view. And he says, in his heart a man plans his course, but the Lord determines his steps. The, uh, the word that is direct, it's, King James says direct, this says determined. It's, it's the word kun. It's pronounced kun, but it's spelled K-U-N. But it actually means, it has the idea that God is in control of every detail of our life. You know, we, we make the plans, but God controls the details. It's amazing how he works. The second verse, Proverbs 16, 33, the lot is cast into the lap, but, it, but it's every decision is from the Lord. And you know about casting lots. They cast lots. That's how they divided the land of, of Israel when they went into and they conquered it. They cast lots. And we don't know exactly what it was, a colored ball, a colored rock, whatever it was. But they're saying that we cast the lot, but God controls the outcome. God is in control of your decisions. Proverbs 19, 21. Many are the plans in a man's heart, but it is the Lord's purpose that prevails. You can make all the plans in this world, but you know, God's going to have the last word. Uh, it's just amazing. I, I, I go on for hours talking about how I wanted to do this, now God did this, and I know you could do the same thing. You've each known the hand of God in your life. The last verse, Proverbs 20, 24. A man's steps are directed by the Lord. How then can anyone understand his own way? And what's interesting about this verse, when it says the, the man, the man's steps are directed by the, war, the Lord, the word is gibor, which is also the word for ma mighty warrior. And, what he, and the other word for man, uh, can anyone, how then can anyone understand his own way? That anyone is Adam, which is the generic word for man. So what God is saying in this verse, if mighty warriors, if kings, if leaders need, uh, if they're directed by God, how much more are we? We're just men. We're normal. We're not Obama. God is directing that man's steps, whether he knows it or not, and I praise God for it. Only God sees the big picture of our life. So these four little verses, they lead us to the second truth about you knowing God's will for your life, and that is God is God, you're not. If, if, you, if you can learn that one thing, you're going to be okay. But if you don't, you just might as well pick out a mountain out here or some hill or something and just start walking around it and walking around it and walking around it because you'll be making the same mistakes all the time. Just don't walk around the church. It looks weird to the people around you. You know, Corey Ten Boom, who you all heard about, uh, she was having trouble going to sleep one night. And she was worried about something was going to happen. And all of a sudden, you know, she was praying and it is hit her. She heard a voice from God. And I think you need to hear this voice. The voice said, go to sleep, Corey. I'm going to be up all night anyway. <laughs> you can't handle tomorrow. You don't want to know about tomorrow. So let God. When I was considering marrying my wife, Lydia, I was struggling. There was many, many things I loved about her. There's a couple things I didn't like about her, but as far as, is she here? No, she's not, okay. <laughs> I loved everything about her, you know. And I, I did this thing. I, I took the Bible. I said, God, would you please show me your will? And I dropped it down, opened up. And you know what? Acts 16, 14 was the first thing my eyes laid eyes on. And here's what it says. One who heard us was a woman named Lydia. <laughs> wow, God. Oh. From the city of Thyatira. I think, God, she had, a, 
She had a chihuahua named Tyra. I go, wow, it's almost the same word. And it said, a seller of purple goods, and her favorite color was purple. And I'm not lying. And, and who was a worshiper of God? And, and she had a, such a sweetheart for God. And I said, God, thank you that she's the one. But then I read the next verse. The next part after it says, it says, the Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. And I go, you mean she's supposed to marry Paul? <laughs> I thought, oh God, what do I do? Now, I made that up. Thank God, right? Who wants a pastor who works that way? The reason I did is because if you depend upon circumstances to tell you how God wants what God wants you to do, you're opening yourself up to being fooled by the angel of light because he can arrange circumstances too. Never depend upon circumstances. God may open doors. God may do amazing things, but don't depend on it. Remember, it's about a relationship with God. It's about that daily walking and living with Him. See, the Pharisees, they said, give us a sign. And that's what you're doing when you're depending upon circumstances. You're saying, God, show me a sign. God doesn't do that. He'll work, but He wants that relationship. There was a, a woman coming to my church in Edgerton, and uh, I thought, man, she seemed godly and she seemed really spiritual, and I, I went to visit her and talked with her. And I, I was asking her about her salvation, and she said, well, she grew up in a church, but she fell away from, the, from God. And, and I said, well, well, how do you know that uh, you're a Christian, you're born again? She says, well, I was, I was sleeping one night, and I was struggling with some stuff, but then, then I, I woke up, and I saw this little Jesus sitting on my bed. And all of a sudden, a light filled the room, and, and I just felt all, all warm inside. And, and I, ever since that day, I, I know I'm a Christian. I didn't argue with her. But as time went on, she became less faithful. She had some problems with some people in the church. And she started to see her character. And I will never argue with your salvation experience. But what I do want to maintain with you is that if it's not based upon faith in this word, then it might be a deception. Amen. It might be, and I'm pretty sure it probably is, a deception. Amen. You're saved by the word of God. Jesus Christ is the word. He reveals his will through the word. Now, I'm out of time. I've got four little principles. Um, Let me, real quickly, I'll cover these real quickly. First principle of knowing God's will for your life. Use the light, wisdom, and intelligence that God has given you to make wise decisions. You know, Peter was let out of prison. Peter was in prison and an angel came in there, unlocked his chains, took him out past two sentry points, opened the iron gate, walked him into the street, but then the Bible says he left him. What was Peter going to do? There's no angel guiding him. Well, you know why? The angel left him because the angel knew he'd know what to do. He'd go. And he'd go back to the people. You, know, you don't have to have God working all the time and telling you what to do for every little thing. Do you really want to bother him with that? I, I knew a friend who had a, that went out to eat with a guy from a church and uh, uh, it was time for ordering dessert. And this one guy, who one of those holier-than-thou people, he, uh, he said, let's pray and ask God for what his will is for this dessert. And I go, that's a bunch of hogwash. We don't bother things about, he gives us a brain, he gives us intelligence, you, you use that in doing what you do. So that's one thing you've got to do. God will always give you wisdom that's supposed to carry you. Okay? He gives you your brain. He gives you light. Now, 
Once you make that decision, you say, God, it's up to you. Do it. I'm, I'm going to do it, but you work it out. And you may say that's wrong. But God wants you to use what he's given you. There's a reason for it. There's a reason for all the whippings I've taken in the past from him. There's a reason for all the, the things I've gone through. It's given me wisdom to know how to face the future. And when I talk to you about a problem you may be having, it's going to be based upon that wisdom that God has given me. It's not because I've got some direct light from God and I know exactly what you need to do. God works in us. We use that. Psalm 106, 15. God gave them their request, but sent leanness into their soul. Always be aware that sometimes your decision will be motivated by what you want in the flesh. By something that nobody can talk you out of. And you just want it. And you've always got to be a, a danger, aware of that danger. And when that happens, just like the children in the wilderness, God will go ahead and let you do it but he will sing, send leanness to your soul and you'll get to the point where you'll realize that that big house that you wanted, that big expensive sports car, or that Rolex watch, all of a sudden, it's just not that important anymore. And believe me, I've had them all. I know what I'm talking about. So beware of that. Second principle. Since you can't see the future, don't expect 100% certainty. Just don't expect it. Don't expect God to give you 100% certainty before you do anything. It's not going to happen. God is going to work through the decisions you make. He's going to lead you many times in those decisions. But sometimes he's going to walk away and see if you make it home. Just like the angel did with Peter. You know, the, the heroes of our faith, they did not have 100% certainty that what they were doing was totally right. Did Noah know about the flood? There had never been rain. Yet he built the ark anyway. Did Moses understand what it would mean to lead these stubborn people out of Egypt? No, but he did it anyway. Did Abraham have a road map of where to go when he left the Ur of Chaldees? No, but he left anyway. Did Joshua know that the walls were going to come tumbling down? No, but he obeyed God anyway. Did Gideon fully grasp God's plan to defeat the Midianites? No. He doubted it from the beginning, but he did it anyway. Did David have a clue what was to come upon him when Samuel poured that oil on his head? No, but he obeyed God anyway. Did Jehoshaphat know how God was going to defeat the Ammonites? No, but he put the singers out in front of the army because God said to do it. And he obeyed. Was Daniel totally sure the lions would welcome him without dropping their jaws on him? No, but he was there, and he praised God anyway. Did Peter know he could walk on water? No, but he stepped out anyway. Did Paul know what would happen when he got to Rome? No, but he says, I'm going to Rome. None of these great heroes of faith knew the outcome. But they were, they were obedient even when they had doubt. The life of faith means living with uncertainty even in the midst of doing God's will. Third principle, God wants guidable people who will trust him even with the details. And I'm going to ask you, are you a guidable person? I'm not saying gullible. I'm saying guidable. If you are not guidable, God will not guide you. So you've got to be guidable. You've, you've got to say with Samuel, speak Lord for your servant hears. You've got to cry out with Isaiah, here I am Lord, send me. And you've got to pray with Jesus, Lord, not my will, but your will be done. Fourth principle, when the time comes, make the best decision you can, leave the results with God. Um, Jerry Sitzer said, God has enough trouble getting us to do his will without making it hard to find. And you're probably thinking that, well, he's an educator. He is an educator. He's a professor at college. He doesn't know anything about a tough decision. 
But there was a day in his life that led him to write the book that this quote is in, where he is sitting on the side of a road, holding one by one, first his mother, then his wife, and then his four-year-old daughter, and he held them as they breathed their life, their, their last breath, because they lost their life in an auto accident. This man knows about facing the will of God. He wrote, though I experienced death, I also experienced life in ways that I never thought possible before. Not after the dark, nor af not after the darkness, as we might suppose, but in the darkness. I did not go through the pain and come out the other side. Instead, I lived in it and found within that pain the grace to survive and eventually grow. I did not get over the loss of my loved ones. Rather, I absorbed the loss into my life like soil receives decaying matter. Until it became a part of who I am, sorrow took up permanent residence in my soul and enlarged it. There are going to be countless things about doing God's will that you're going to think are mistakes. They're because they eat at your heart. They cause sorrow. They cause pain. But if you accept God as being sovereign over your life, if you accept God as being the Lord of your life, and you say, God, guide me. Make this a stepping stone. God will make that sorrow. He'll make that pain. He'll make every good thing, every bad thing. He'll make it a part of your life. He'll enlarge you through it. He will be your God through it. That is the God that we serve. And that is the God who will show you his will. You come to that valley of decision this morning, right now. And I know that there are some of you who are struggled, have struggled in the past with what God has done. You are struggling in the present with what God may be doing. And you know that there are things that you are having a hard, hard time accepting. But you come to the valley of decision where you look into God and you say, God, I don't know where this leads me. I don't know what you're doing through it, but God, I want your will in my life. I want to listen to you. I want to learn to love you. I want this to be a stepping stone to my joy that will be in your presence. And then you'll say with Job, he has taken me through this and made me like gold. God has proven what, that he wants what's best for you. You may think he doesn't, but he does because he gave us his son, Jesus Christ. Every pain, every sorrow, every suffering that you could even imagine enduring is nothing compared to the cup that Jesus Christ took. The very fact that Jesus said, Father, if it be thy will, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, thy will be done. The very fact he said that means that he could have done God's will without that cup. But God came back and said, no, that cup is a part of my will. You do my will. So the truth to us is that we all hold cups in our lives. We hold cups. In his case, it was the cup of wrath. Your cup may be a car. Your cup may be a job. Your cup may be something that you say, God, I know this is your will. This is a part of your will. Don't take it away. And God says, if you want to do my will, you be willing to give up everything. You be willing to give up anything. And even those things that you think you can't live without, you say, God, it's yours. Your will be done. So if you come to the valley of decision, you come with the willingness to let go of the cup, to let go of what you want, and you say, God, it's your will.
And here's the prayer I leave you with. Oh Lord, your will be done. Nothing more, nothing less, nothing else. Amen. Let's pray. Father, I pray for each one here that they would seek to see you. Seek to know your will for their life. And God, I pray that each one would come to that decision where they're willing to let go of anything they want and say, God, not my will, but your will. Nothing more, nothing less, nothing else. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.